Thank you. So I just have to take a moment. Um, you know, I've been in AI for a long time, frankly, as long as I can remember. And when I step back and look at this stuff and hear this stuff, I have to say, isn't this incredible? I'm so glad I lasted this long to see, <laughs> to see what has become of this field and to see the amazing advances. I mean, it's just amazing. And one of the things that sort of I want to take you through today, or at least one of the takeaways from my talk is it's not enough. We're not there yet. In spite of the tremendous advances, and really, I think what, what, what should be uh, viewed as an amazing revolution that's going to influence not just technology, but really how we live and how we think and our culture and how we, how we, how we collaborate and work together, it's not enough. We have to raise the bar. We have to expect machines not just to compute an answer or come up with the next prediction or find a pattern in the data, but we have to get machines to understand and think the way we do so that they can really become collaborative thought partners, that they can actually help us think, create, uh, advance, learn from each other and from, and from that collaboration with the machine. In fact, we communicate, collaborate, build, and create through a shared understanding. That's how we work together. That's how we reason, that we debate, we advance our ideas through a shared understanding. And machines today, you're seeing it, you're feeling it, it's happening already. They're, be, they're advising or actually acting as our doctors, assistants, drivers, policymakers, lawmakers, and so forth. Do they have a shared understanding? It's remarkable what they can do, but are, do they have a view, an explicable view of the world that, can, that is compatible with ours. So exactly what kind of intelligence are we creating? Is it mimicking our biases or improving the way we think? So in spite of the incredible things it can do, I'm saying let's raise the bar. So I have three stories um, that I think help us think about how machines work to help us make decisions. And I want to com compare and contrast what our expectations are relative to what these things actually do. So my first one is in economic predictions. So in a statistical machine learning process, we discover patterns. So imagine the big question is, uh, will, uh, is the recession imminent? So we take huge volumes of data and compute power, and we heard all these talks about it, and we pick out some features that we think might, be, might read on the result, like the GDP, the debt, uh, debt levels, um, interest rates and so forth, it could be a huge number of these things. We train some network, maybe a deep learning network. We're looking for patterns in data to predict whether or not there was a recession, whether there was going to be a recession or not, using past data to predict future, future possibilities. And we get a prediction in the end. And we might have a description, and this actually comes from a similar discussion in Nate Silver's book, The Signal and the Noise, which is the most reliable forward-looking indicators are now collectively behaving as they did on the cusp of a full-blown recession. That's the kind of explanation we can expect out of a system like this. Maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. If it's right a lot, you can make a lot of money. A very powerful, powerful technique, and we see a huge number of areas that we're all well, well aware of, whether it's in healthcare and imaging and e-commerce, robotics, talent, politics, on and on, where with the compute power and with the data, we can train these deep learning networks to make these predictions, but our explanations fall a little bit flat. They're not open, they're not transparent to the way we think about how we model the world. You can imagine a very different approach where humans sit down and they study a phenomenon and they build a theory. And this is, in fact, where a lot of the emphasis was in the beginning of artificial intelligence. But there are lots of problems with this approach, which we're well aware of. But if it works, you get a causal model, and causal models allow humans to produce these, these shared explanations, things we can make sense of and we can reason about, and you get an explicable prediction. And you might have an explanation, again, from Nate Silver's book. Consumers have extended too much credit to pay for homes that the housing bubble had made unaffordable. Many had stopped making their payments, and there are likely to be sustained losses. The degree of leverage or debt in the system would compound the problem, paralyzing the financial industry. The shock might be large enough to trigger a severe recession. A very different kind of explanation. The problem is building this theory, managing, maintaining that theory requ uh, requires a lot of skilled labor and a continuous attention to how that information is represented, how it's communicated, how it's organized, and again, very expensive. No comparison to be able, be able to simply build a statistical model. 
but there's a big difference in the kind of outcome that can it produce. Watson was a landmark in AI. We just uh, heard uh, from IBM about it. And um, you know, one of the interesting uh, Jeopardy questions that uh, Watson uh, did very well on, and we can test you on it too, um, it's one of my favorite ones. Uh, Treasury Secretary Chase just submitted this to me for the third time. Guess what, pal? This time I'm accepting it. Anybody? Resignation. Resignation, very good. And so I like, how did you do that? Do you actually know the history? Or did you use sort of a, a language model, basically predicted what's the most plausible thing based on the language? What do you think? So how many people know the history? So not too many. So basically, you look at this and you think, gee, you know, it, you know what kinds of things get submitted? I have this pattern in my brain based on hearing a lot of language. You throw in other information, like it's a, a president. Uh, um, it's significant enough to, to ask a question about sort of what might it be. And so all these different paths allow you to narrow in on, on, a, on, a, on a conclusion, on a guess, right? But the context means everything, the context that allows you to narrow in on that, on that answer, even though you're not deeply understanding the history. So the same question was given to a sixth grade class, and they used that same technique of plausible reasoning, and they got a very different answer. <laughs> and, the, and the reason is that's the, right, the model that they built in their head says the next thing following submitting something is a friend request. You know, who cares about the underlying knowledge? That's not where my head's at, right? So techniques like this, as you well know, um, can be used to drive chatbots, and they can sort of appear to have these good, deep conversations with you, but do they really understand what's going on? Or are they just mimicking the, mimicking the patterns that appear in common language? So, you know, just a quick sanity check. I went to a bot and I said, should I bet on a recession happening in the coming months? And why? And the answer was the closest bank is located at Sorry, uh, is that a yes? Are you telling me I should go take my money out right now? I don't know how to respond to that. If everyone did that, might that cause a recession? <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that. So, you know, we can build these language models and they're really cool. Do they understand what we're talking about? Um, so I think that's the challenge. I have another uh, story for you, which is um, a, a personal story about actually my, my, my dad. It was some number of years ago, my dad actually went into cardiac arrest uh, in, a, in a restaurant, and um, it took a while for the ambulance to get there. Uh, so but, uh, eventually uh, he got, got to a hospital, and I was, you know, it was, unfortunately there was a whole party of people, so there was a bunch of people were in the waiting room waiting to see what happened. It was a frightful moment. A resident comes out and says, um, you know, your dad's brain dead, and you have to sign a do not resuscitate. And, you know, I, um, I dare to ask, like, why? Like, how do you know? You know, he's brain dead. And, of course, they had a statistical model with a combination of variables where, on average, uh, everything that had happened, you know, the age, the wait time for the ambulance, um, the blood pressure, the dilation of the pupils, and so forth and so on, you know, strongly correlated with, you know, your dad's brain dead. There's a 98% chance, I was told. And I said, I'm sorry, but, like, if I was betting on this, uh, and I had to bet a thousand times, I do pretty well with those odds, but this is a very asymmetrical risk. I need to know exactly why you think my dad, the man in that room, and they were doing all these hero heroic measures at that point, trying to keep him alive, uh, keep his heart beating, why you think he's brain dead? And so the resident says, well, I'm sorry, I can't help you, you have to talk to the chief cardiologist. And I raised the same questions with the chief cardiologist. And he said, well, his pupils are dilated. And I said, is there another reason why his pupils might be dilated? And there was a pause. Well, we do give him a drug in the ambulance that dilates his pupils. OK, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> so no, so no. Until you can give me deductive evidence that that man, my father, is brain dead, then I'll ta we'll talk about signing a do not resuscitate. And I wouldn't sign it. Long story short, um, the doctor made me make all the decisions because he was convinced. So to decide whether or not he should be moved, what kinds of drugs should be given, and what the pros and cons of the drugs are. So here I am making all these decisions. Long story short, 18 hours later, my dad's sitting up in bed, zero brain damage. Hey, Dad, and I, he said to me, hey, Dave, I understand you thought I was dead. And I'm like, yeah, all right. Um, anyway, so um, you know, to step back, 
Thank you. Thank you. So um, we have to step back and think about like how do we want to how do we want to imagine what intelligence really is when artificial intelligence is going to play a bigger bigger role in our lives? And there have been all these definitions, um, you know, some attributed to Alan Turing, to John McCarthy, and like one of the things I started to, to submit or propose is. Can we define a definition that makes us humans who are designing, uh, designing these intelligences more accountable? Um, so here's one that says, uh, computers are intelligent if they can learn to answer and explain well enough for humans to take individual responsibility for any decision made on the basis of those answers. Yeah, like that pinches a little bit. That stings a little bit. And this isn't to say that this kind of, this kind of accountability should exist in all cases. But we at least have to step back and think, is this how we should be imagining the role of artificial intelligence? Where does it really matter that we have these explanations that we can reason about and that we can critically analyze? So the quest for why, right? This is a common experience where you have your uh, child asking you, but why, mommy, why, daddy, why, why, why? And I think we should rejoice when our children pummel us with the barrage of whys, because this is suggesting that they know what they don't know, that they're trying to build that shared understanding. It's through that dialogue and through that very explicit learning process that they're saying, how do you think about the world? And how should I model the world so that we can communicate with one another? So why is that true? And how does that work? And, and, and I want to push the limits of my understanding, filling in the gaps. That communication is inspiring when we think about learning and building a shared understanding. In 2015, I started uh, this company called Elemental Cognition. And we are literally teaching our AI system to learn the same way humans learn, through reading, reasoning, and building a shared understanding. We have to conquer that problem with old AI that humans sit there and there and build these big theories and you need highly skilled labor to manage this and maintain it and figure out how to communicate it slow, and it's slow. We have to conquer that, but we can't abandon the requirement that machines understand. So we have to find a way to teach them and that they can learn how to build that shared understanding. And we literally are starting at the, at the beginning where the machine interacts and starts with simple stories tries to interpret them, gets stuff wrong, asks questions, asks questions, learns, builds knowledge, and goes to the next level and tries to use that knowledge to now understand the next thing, exactly the way humans build that shared understanding. So we're building a machine that sort of takes that approach. So here's a simple story about soccer that it tries to read. The soccer game was merely over. The two teams were tied one to one. Alex kicked the ball. Oops, she kicked it the wrong way. What a bad kick, Alex thought. But wait, her teammate John jumped to stop the ball. The ball went off John into the goal. Alex seemed one. Hooray, it was not a bad kick after all. It seems really simple. I mean, this is like first grade material. But do we understand it? It's not just words, it's not just patterns in the text, it's not just about superficial you know, um, uh, data. It, it basically refers to an experience, a human experience. So the system, uh, who won the game? And the system gets Alice's team, but that's easy. You know, just using word matching, it could be even more complex than that. And we do train deep learning networks to do the simple statistical pattern matching in the language. And then, but we always, always require an explanation. And it says, it says, Alice's team won the game, but I don't really know. I mean, basically, I'm just matching the text, and that's not good enough because the system holds itself to a different standard. This system holds itself to the, to the standard that it needs a logical interpretation of the text in order to say, I know what's going on. How many points did Alice's team win? Doesn't even know. It's not anywhere in the text. The answer is two, but it's not there. You could pick a number, it would be one. So... It doesn't know, and it doesn't, and it doesn't know why. And in fact, it realizes that it doesn't really know what soccer is, doesn't really know what a team sport is, and it finds other content that it can now dialogue with you and, and build the basics, and then use those basics to go back to that story and understand. 
So it picks this other story. It says, hey, soccer is this team sport, but I don't, understand what, I don't understand what a team sport is. I read some other stories and found the following sentences, which, which mostly related to team sport. And it now it builds its own questions based on doing classical statistical machine learning over large corpora and, and figures out what questions should I ask to get at the basic understanding. Another one. Two teams compete with each other in a match. What does that mean? Does it mean each team wants to win? Each team wants the other team not to win? It's building a logical interpretation. Then it finally says, oh, I think I understand what I read here. Let me go back to the other, let me go back to the other story. It actually tries to generalize. So it builds an understanding. If you say the understanding makes sense, it says, okay, that's great. I think I understand what a team sport is. I'm gonna look at other sports. I'm gonna read about other sports. And you tell me, am I getting this right? just the way you, you would imagine a kid would start to do as they expand their knowledge base. So it builds this understanding. It identifies the events, the timeline that occurs in the story. It actually looks at, it starts to build like a, a relative map of what's going on geospatially. Where are the characters at different points in the story as you walk through the timeline, how they're related to each other. It actually looks at the motivations, try to understand the motivations and the actions that the various characters take. It goes to um, actually looking at uh, the, act, the structure. You know, there are teams, there are 11 players in each team. John and Alice, where are they? So it looks at the, the objects and their relative structures. Once it builds that understanding and it has a logical interpretation of the story, it goes back and tries to answer the questions. Who won the game? Alice's team. Why? Alice's team won because Alice's team had more points than the other team. Now it knows what points are, knows what scores are. How many points did Alice's team have? Two. First, Alice's team had one point, then John moved the ball to the goal. John is part of Alice's team, therefore Alice's team had two points. With that basic foundation for interpreting language, learning what it needs to know, understanding what it doesn't know, and learning what it needs to know, it's satisfied when it's built that logical interpretation and established that shared understanding based on communicating and collaborating with you. This is the vision that we have of AI at, at, at Elemental Cognition. And if we can teach computers to read, learn, and understand, I believe AI will dramatically amplify our productivity and our creative potential. I mean, can you imagine um, where you can engage computers with questions like this? I have a new idea for applying stem cells to organ regeneration. Can we explore its possibilities, pros, and cons? Read these 1,000 articles and let's discuss it. Or how might the economy be affected by a dramatic reduction in the human labor force required for transportation of people and goods? Why do you think that? What plays have you read that might act as a metaphor for helping us better understand today's racial relations? Can you explain the connection and the implications of different approaches? Yes, this is definitely raising the bar, but we can't shy away from that because like it or not, AI is gonna be part of our world and we have to start thinking about what role do we want it to play? How do we wanna work with it? And I think we want it to be our thought partners that are ultimately amplify both our intelligence and our creative potential. Thank you. Thank you.